amazing, isn't it, really, how much technology has changed our everyday lives? Just the other day, I came across a very interesting study done by AVG, which is an internet security company. And the study showed that the average 11-year-old child has adult skills when it comes to technology. Or as AVG chief executive J.R. Smith puts it, technologically speaking, today's kids can walk the walk. And I believe that this especially applies to IB students. Growing up, this idea of a technology-centered future really fascinated me. But apart from technology, there was another thing that caught my eye growing up that equally fascinated me. And that was the sheer number of problems that every nation in the world seemed to face, whether it was hunger, poverty, disease, you name it. As a kid, I really obsessed over two main questions. Why did these problems exist? And what could we do to solve them? And really, these two questions are what got me thinking, what can we actually do to solve these problems? So basically, for the rest of my talk, I want to talk to you about some of the experiences I've had over the past four years that profoundly changed the way that I view the world's problems and that strengthened my belief that biotechnology can truly revolutionize the world. So out of curiosity, how many of you had breakfast this morning? I know it sounds like a really weird question, right? But I only ask this because the World Hunger Education Service estimated that there are 925 million people in the world who are considered hungry. And I'm not talking about the kind of hungry you and I get when we're in classes or in between classes, but those on the brink of malnourishment or even death. So when you look at this statistically, that's nearly one in every seven people who don't know where their next meal is coming from. And most of these people live in developing nations. When I came across this statistic, the first thing that popped into my mind was the question, why? why? Is it that globally we don't produce enough food to help sustain these people? And astonishingly, what I found out was that this really isn't the case. And the real problem here is that many people across the world don't have the conditions necessary to grow or the income to purchase enough food. And nowhere is this problem more prevalent than in developing nations like India or Sudan. So let me share with you a little story. Um, three summers ago, I remember going back to India. That's where most of my family still lives. And I remember going to a local market there with my grandfather. And then I remember seeing that the price of rice had increased dramatically since the last time I'd been there. And because of this, because rice is such a staple food, there was much tension between the government and the people. But it really got me wondering, why was there a sudden increase in the price of crops, such as rice, or anything else for that matter. And as it turned out, the monsoon season that year had been very rough, and the crop output wasn't enough to sustain the population. And simple economics tells you that when you have a decrease in the supply of goods while maintaining a constant rate of demand, or even in this case, increasing the rate of demand, you'll always see a price increase. So, and a very similar situation happened actually in Sudan last year, where very poor rainfall actually de decreased food security for the entire nation. So this, what does this really mean? This meant that millions of people were going to have to pay more than they could afford. And the more I thought about it, the more I came to realize that this isn't really a problem that's India-centric or even developing nation-centric, but it's a problem faced by every nation in the world to some degree. Uh, so when I returned to the US, I began to wonder whether it was possible to increase food security. And the first solution that kind of came to my mind was genetically modified crops. And GM crops can be modified to represent any desired characteristic. For example, in the case of India or Sudan, it'd be beneficial for us to engineer drought-resistant crops. And so one gene that I researched that actually does this is the sub-1A crop, or the sub-1A gene, which can be embedded in crops. And basically what this does is that it gives uh, crops, such as rice, the ability to sustain, in, or sustain themselves in conditions like drought, or as the video shows, even in flooding. So what are the implications of this? The implications of this are that even under agriculturally unfriendly conditions, crops can still produce a normal output or even a greater output than they originally could. So what does this mean in the scope of people? Well, people won't have to pay more. And this means that we, ca we can decrease world hunger levels, ensuring that people's basic needs aren't the things driving them into poverty. But 
a very common question that often comes up, especially when you're dealing with stuff like this, is don't we already have measures in place that attempt to fix this problem? And uh, well, really we do, but there's a reason why I believe that the system doesn't work. And I believe that, honestly, many of the current programs aim to distribute food to the places that need them, distribute. But I believe that the first step in promoting self-dependence and truly making an impact on food security is by giving the people the means to grow the food themselves at the rate they need it and under their respective circumstances. And so I believe that GM crops are truly the first step towards this. But apart from that, you can kind of tell that this really wasn't enough for me. And after I realized that the amazing potential of biotechnology, it really had me hooked. And it wasn't long before I began to question, what else can we do with biotechnology? So another timely problem is that of pollution. And I don't really need to tell you the adverse impacts pollution has on our environment. Did you know that every day, about 2 million tons of waste is discharged into our world's oceans? that's nearly equivalent to the weight of the entire human population. And I'm sure you can guess that the impacts this has on our ecosystems. Uh, there's been a widespread decline in biological health in inland waters, a decrease in species biodiversity, and roughly 2.2 million deaths annually, most of whom are children under the age of five. So searching for a potential solution to this problem, I managed to get an internship at a local university, the University of South Florida's Ecosystems Technology Group. And basically the goal, like Ms. Dr. Jaffray was talking about earlier, was very simple. It's about collaboration between man and machine and how we can truly help us tackle very difficult problems. So last summer, I got a chance to take a look at a new project that they were working on, and that's what you see behind me. And it really consists of two parts, a mechanical sampler, which is back here, and a SOV, which stands for Solar Powered Autonomous Underwater Vehicle. And the idea, again, is very simple. It's basically just to, uh, so these robots can autonomously go and take water samples and transmit the data they collected wirelessly back to the operator. But you may be wondering, well, how am I supposed to know what all this is? Well, they transformed all the complicated outputs into something much more accessible using Twitter. It actually tweets its current location depth, water level, and everything else. So you can actually follow the robot as the picture actually shows you. But it, it's a very simple idea, and it aims to connect ordinary people with something that's relatively complex. So imagine what the possibilities of this kind of technology is. We're, we can send fleets of these autonomous robots to continuously take samples all across the world. And when, whenever one of these robots actually picks something up, we can then go in and efficiently diagnose or uh, treat the problem. And because these robots are primarily solar powered, we can monitor our oceans 24-7 around the clock. And because it's a clean energy source, we're not contributing back to the problem. So what does this mean on a larger scale? The longer we wait to take more efficient action to reduce pollution levels in our world's oceans, the more we risk losing the diversity of species within the world's oceans. And on top of that, less pollution means a decrease in the number of deaths of ocean-dwelling creatures, which in and of itself is a good thing. But on top of that, people who use the ocean as a resource can, can, you to, can continue to do so. So what does this all really mean? Why is it significant to us IB students and teachers? What did I learn, and why does it matter? I learned that, believe it or not, there is a world beyond tests, IAs, and EEs, although it came as a shock to me. Uh, IB teaches us something much more valuable. It teaches us valuable lessons, regardless of the profession or career that we plan on pursuing. These experiences have taught me that IB is beyond everything going perfectly. It's about taking on challenges and rising to the occasion. What's truly important is that regardless of whether the immensity of the challenges that are presented before us, it's imperative to approach them with creativity, passion, and determination. Furthermore, it's imperative that we take actions to pursue our interests. In IB especially, it's crucial that our pursuit of learning and becoming knowledgeable, open-minded, and creative thinkers is augmented with experiential learning. And I believe that most teachers in here would agree with me when I say that textbooks will only teach us so much. We need to remember to be risk takers. I believe that teachers should encourage us to go and gain real world knowledge and then bring it back into the classroom to share. And so that way we have another way of answering the infamous TOK question, how do you know? <laughs> to whom much is given, much is expected. And I truly believe that by taking an early interest, 
just as he has, we can revolutionize the world. Thank you.